Labor. Depression. Protection. How does class isolate us? Within our own classes and between classes? And how do our roles in society dictate the ways we interact with others? Or the ways we find ourselves alone? I think we're all a little more used to isolation nowadays, and how it affects us both individually and culturally. So it's no wonder, for me at least, that I've taken solace in media that explores isolation in a variety of ways. There were actually a number of other works I was thinking of discussing in this essay, from Welcome to the NHK, to Firewatch, to Walkabout, and The Thing. So if there's interest, be on the lookout for this to turn into a little bit of a series. But I decided to center in on these works, The Lighthouse, We're All Going to the World's Fair, and the episode Safe Room in Season 2 of Succession because they best illustrate the stark contrast in which isolation is felt from class to class. If you could sum up the lighthouse in one word, it'd be labor. Labor of the body, labor of the mind, labor of the spirit. Passive and active labor. Our introduction to the passive labor we as the audience will be suffering through with Thomas is that of the foghorn. To me, it's the key to everything. This horrible, droning, monstrous, barreling cry that never fucking ends. Within the first three minutes, we see the duo's semi-professional portrait interrupted by Thomas's upset at the foghorn. And forgive me if it sounds childish, but I genuinely think there's a connection between the foghorn and the farting. Two sounds that are uncontrollable, annoying at first, but really great on you as time goes on. The environment of the lighthouse is harsh, cold, unforgiving, and achingly routine from the start. Not just in the foghorn, but in the slapping sounds of the waves and the wind, their clothes, even the harsh orthochromatic black and white Eggers uses to accurately capture the time. Everything has a weight to it. But the labor is just as equally spending time with Tom as it is throwing shit in the water. And we'll talk more about their power dynamics in a bit. But what I specifically find so interesting about their relationship when it comes to labor is how it trumps their only sense of identity for themselves and each other. The first thing Tom asks Thomas about is his other work. Most of their conversations revolve around their current or previous work. Just like any man. Want to settle down quiet like with some marinings? Sometime soon I'll raise my own roof. Somewhere up country. No one to tell me what for. Their climactic fight is about Tom's cruel reports in the logbook. Severance without pay? Severance without pay! I'm a hard worker. I am. I work as hard as any man. When you're poor, blue collar, or living paycheck to paycheck, something most young men around the time of the lighthouse would be, most of life is work. In order to live, one must make a living, and in order to make a living, one must work. The endless cycle, made more endless by the level of inscrutable and strenuous labor Thomas is forced to do again and again throughout the film. When the wikis are talking one night, Thomas says, How else am I going to find respectable work? almost looking into the camera as he says it. It's a confrontation to the viewer as well. How do you let power dynamics go unchecked in your professional life? How are you profiting from unseen labor? But just that look in his eyes brings us back to our fundamental question here. In order to live, he must work, but to work, he must isolate himself, toil, go mad, and make himself inhuman. And his question poses the question, is that really living at all? And when the reality of the insanity of one's situation is too much, only one thing could happen. Madness sets in. Maybe when he kills the seagull? For Thomas, he was playing a zero-sum game. Do the work or not, Thomas will find something wrong with it. Play employee, he wants a friend. Play the friend, well, he's your boss. And his encounter and subsequent murder and identity stealing of his previous boss, Ephraim Winslow, took its toll either way. Secrets isolate you, make you want to hide, make you paranoid, traumatized. But telling them to the wrong person is a whole different hell, as Thomas comes to find out. Because the wikis are the most physically isolated from other people, we see the most physiological effects of isolation, including the massive distortion of time, along with the distortion of reality. How long have we been on this rock? Five weeks? Two days? Where are we? Who are you again, Tommy? 
are probably a figment of your imagination. This rock is a figment of your imagination too. Because it's hard enough to know what the truth is when it's bounced off of this guy, losing his mind and still trying to psych you out. But the lack of food, lack of clean water, which causes alcohol to be the primary drink, it all adds up to a fucking mess with no baseline that just descends and unravels exponentially. And while Thomas is obviously going through it, Thomas done this so long he lost his wife and children. It's obviously had a lifelong impact on him. You ain't even human no more. Working apart from folks so long. So even though their madness centers on each other, Tom feels the need to keep Thomas with him. Something else living and breathing near him, no matter who or what it is. Don't leave me! He destroys their only way out because he doesn't want to be alone, despite trying to kill the guy minutes after. Still, I find the way they cling to each other like babies so interesting. They dance and hug, and even when they fight, it's so intensely physical. This innate need to be connected to another person, to hold on to anything real. Which is why the rewatch I did for this freaked me out more than normal, because I started to think they're the same person. But that's a whole other video. The film creates a lack of privacy through false barriers, a visual symbol for the false boundaries the two men pretend to have at the beginning of the film, which Tom immediately breaks through none other than the farting. Through the labor, both physically and emotionally, Thomas and all other laborers lose their identity, and even their personhood. And because of the power structures put inherently in place, the lesser person in any of these power dynamics has to take it. Tom consistently threatens Thomas with not only his logbook and how his annals will affect him in future job prospects, You're making eye marks in me logbook, things gospel. but also threatens lack of pay for labor already done, toil already spent. I find it really fascinating how this film so perfectly brings to the surface how the cycle of power will always leave someone at a disadvantage, specifically in the ways the system makes people want to maintain power imbalances. It's almost like hazing. Well, my boss tortured me through all my 20s, now I get to do it to you. It's only fair. And by watching this play out in the island microcosm, it sheds a bigger light on how this works in the real world. How it ripples. How no one making tons of money can do so without profiting off exploitation. Exploiting those who exploit others and so on. And so, obviously, this builds resentment in Thomas. Some kind of prod out of molesting me. Two men living on top of each other, one allowed to treat the other however they want, reflecting his own problems onto you and forcing you to work harder than he seemingly ever has. Of course you'd be upset and confused and look for your own ways to act out against it. One of my favorite lines in the film comes from Thomas trying to get out what he's built up inside for so long, and I find it so telling about who he is and how these systems affect him. You ain't no general, you ain't no copper. You, you ain't the president, and you ain't my father, and I'm sick of you acting like you is. Despite the fact that he's fighting against the tyrannical reign Tom has thrust upon them, the figures he chooses to pledge allegiance to, the military, police, the government, and his father, are all masculine regimes held up by continuous exploitation of the working class. Whether it's procuring poor young men to fight and die for their countries, how police use these narratives of power to dehumanize poor and non-white people to more easily use violence against them, how the government sanctions poor conservative voters to fight for politicians who are fundamentally against their best interests, and, while not a system like the other three, fatherhood and patriarchal family systems are the reason like 90% of us are so fucked up today. So I keep mentioning power, and I think one of the fundamental ways we see power isolate anyone, but specifically the wikis in this case, is through ownership. Because the two of them have so few to their name, and they live in small, identical quarters, eating identical food and wearing identical clothes, we start to see each man take ownership of something that can only be theirs. For Thomas, it's the mermaid, which obviously ends up creating a lot of madness in and of itself, but when he finds it, he keeps it secret and only shows it to the world in intimate moments when he's alone. The mermaid and the real mermaid themselves, mixed with all of these delusions Thomas has while he's doing work alone, speak to a different type of ownership. The ownership of something abstract, his secrets, his identity, his true self. It feels empowering to both men to keep things to themselves. Maybe things would have cleaned up nice at the end if Thomas had just owned his secrets and let them be his. And Tom has many secrets of his own. 
We only hear writings from the logbook, which was locked away until the end of the film. Tom either knowingly or unknowingly lies about his past, which means only he knows the true story. But the most important thing Tom owns is the light. While Thomas gets to focus on back-breaking labor, Tom's work is staring into the light, something only he gets despite what the rule book says. Tom has obviously worked for a long time to be able to control the light, and it's probably the main reason he keeps coming back. What is the light? It's power incarnate. Greed. It's past orgasmic. To own the light is to own everything. Tom even breaks from being buried alive to try to keep that secret to himself again. Almost as if the mystical powers of the light could bring him back to life, jolt him up just one more time to save what was his. But that ultimate power is broken when Thomas consumes it as well or is consumed by it. And in the final shot, once the light, the ultimate power has rejected him, Thomas is food for the gulls. Not only a punishment or karma, but food. The cycle of life, the labor of hunting, eating his meat, using him to further life. It's a living, it's respectable work. He is, and thus the working class is rendered fundamentally inhuman. A machine capable of desire and madness and labor and nothing else. He needs the mystical power of the light for the sake of ownership and authority. A divine masculine power of light and truth. Something to make him more. And when all hell breaks loose, Thomas is able to regain control. At least in those insane few moments. Subverting both his relationship to Tom and Ephraim, as well as asserting himself of his own power, dominance, individuality, masculinity, and humanity. To make someone else not human, that is what makes him human, as it's what made his forebears human. An endless cycle, creating dehumanization and isolation up the wazoo, whether literally, physically, through geographical separation and toil or emotionally through the politics of power and control. We're All Going to the World's Fair is a treatise of middle-class depression, and more specifically, dissociation. A common way a lot of people, especially young people these days, experience depression is through dissociation or derealization, thinking either you yourself aren't real or the world you're in isn't. This world wasn't real. It's just some kind of big dream we need to wake up from. Not only does Casey talk very openly about her dissociation through the film. It's funny, I'd be dreaming. I know I'd be dreaming when it used to happen. But it was like I was also awake at the same time. It was like watching myself on a TV all the way across the room. And I was aware of my actions. Yes, granted, I was aware, but I couldn't control myself. But World Fair itself facilitates an environment where we ourselves will dissociate too. Whether it's the digital noise grain or lack of light that distorts Casey's face, the beautiful but enabling eerie atmospheres of Alex G's soundtrack, or the ways that each video Casey watches describes different aspects of derealizing. I think the most apt example of that is I can't feel my body. No one feels their body when they're derealized. A body cannot exist physically in a digital space. After a chilling and anonymous introduction, we meet the only other person we'll hear and see for the rest of the film, fellow horror enthusiast JLB. JLB offers a different type of upper middle class, masculine isolation to Casey's young, feminine, middle to lower middle class isolation. From the first shot we see him, it's pretty obvious he doesn't get out much. It's also obvious he's into a lot of things people much younger than him are the intended audience for. Or is it his childhood bedroom? Which is made all the more odd considering how big his house is. Does he have a well-paying job or is he living off someone else? He's also seen drinking milk a lot, a symbol of both innocence and predation. One time when his, and this is really how she's credited, question mark comes home. He digitally caresses Casey, watches her videos on the toilet, and at the climax of the film, when Casey outright calls him a pedophile, He's holding the remote in quite a symbolic fashion. So what does all this mean in the context of his relationship with Casey? As the film goes on, we see how isolating her only relationship makes her feel. And it's especially complicated with someone as eccentric as JLB, as both the target and oppressor are isolated and vulnerable in different ways. I'm nobody. Whoever's watching this, 
must be a little bit of a, a lonely person. Someone reached out and backed her into a corner. Someone who's taken it upon himself to seemingly look out for and protect her. But how isolating would that be to have this person usurp your only outlet? It's dangerous the way they help and hurt each other, regardless of if JLB knows better or not. I talked about madness a lot in the lighthouse section, but this idea of isolation driving you mad, not knowing what's real and who to trust is consistent within World's Fair as well. It's easier to act crazy all alone, easier to get stuck in those thoughts or act out on them in harmful ways because there's no one there to stop us or question judgment. And it's a lot easier to not know if something is real or not when you have no one else to base your beliefs on. And I'll touch on this more later, but Casey being young and depressed means she takes things very seriously. And not even that she really does, but she pretends to until she's stuck in it. I guarantee we've all had an experience like this. Something you start to act serious or dramatic about as a joke or a performance, which ends up biting you in the ass when things really do get that scary or dangerous or serious. And when the dull dissociative pain of everyday life is too much to bear, teens will turn to dramatics just to feel something. But this type of dramatizing something in your life is sort of the central question of the film. How aware is Casey of all of this? How much did she know was real or not? Did she think it wasn't a game? Or did she know and get sucked in? Like she says Casey isn't her name. Is that really true? The playing field of the game she and JLB have found themselves in is labyrinthian when it comes to the truth. Still, one of the most interesting things I find about this is the way it mirrors a lot of socially anxious, isolated young people who find their only solace on the internet. She treats her vague, anonymous, tiny audience as a trusted friend to confide in, saying things she wouldn't say to anyone in real life but can alone, projecting her thoughts to people without the work of being connected to them which is made all the more interesting when we start to see her interact with JLB. Someone still on the internet, and anonymous, but now face to face, or as close as you can be to that on the internet. And she acts incredibly awkward. She can't even look the camera in the eyes. I'm sorry, I'm not that good at talking with other people. I find the lack of Casey's real life connections to be so interesting, because another film that portrays the 21st century isolated adolescent so well is Eighth Grade. But Kayla's isolation is seen in contrast to others, whereas Casey's is null and void. Both films actually mirror each other a lot. You can tell straight from their opening sequences, World's Fair is like the hot topic to 8th grade's Claire's. As if we're her internet friends, we get her deep thoughts, but not her day-to-day -day activities. We literally don't know where she goes to school, if she goes to school at all, if she has any friends, where her mother is, etc. We never even get to see any part of her house besides her bedroom and the kitchen where she goes out to eat. But even then, she's on her phone. This is true too when it comes to her father, someone who's merely a literal voice of authority, isolating herself from the internet whenever he's around. In this way, JLB is the opposite to her father, internet and active, rather than IRL and passive. Her isolation from her father feels even more apparent when we realize the film takes place during the holidays, as Casey trudges through uniform, dull, middle-class, could-be-anywhere America, stuck on winding sidewalks, through chain storefronts, and endless cars. Which I think speaks to this fundamental middle-class depression. Having enough to survive so you can start to look around, judge, overthink, and the holidays are an incredibly isolating time for a lot of people. Whether it's watching the hordes of people clamor for high-tech Christmas gifts, or having to hide your real self at your grandma's house, when you're not in the holiday spirit, the world can look particularly disgusting, fake, and shallow, and you can feel even more isolated from others who are. And that trip downtown as the ball drops is the only time we see her near lots of people, but it's also her lowest, most isolated point in the film. I love how the ball drops just as she finishes this disturbed monologue about killing herself and her dad. It so expertly captures that feeling of knowing you're a downer, even in the crowd. Everybody laughing and having a good time making you feel alien, like you're the only not normal person around, and everyone and everything who's normal or happy is a threat. Hey, stop smiling. Stupid, you're an idiot. And I've certainly danced around it a lot, but overall, We're All Going to the World's Fair is literally just the best depiction of teenage mental illness ever put to film. 
All of Casey's quirks and isms and reactions to things feel so lived in and real, and I think the best example of that throughout the film is the scene before JLB's first message. Upset at the world, and firstly herself, she gets herself out of her room and trudges through her property to a shed, making a beeline for what we'd assume is her father's gun. Taking it out, looking at it, and putting it back. This moment so captures that spiteful rebellion that comes from being young and upset. Ooh, I'm a teen, but I'm so grown up. I could do anything right now. The world is mine. Taking solace in the isolation. Just looking at the gun gives her the power she needs in that moment. As an obviously mentally ill person who's passively suicidal, she seeks control even if it's a last resort, but has to remind herself she can put her finger on the trigger whenever she wants to. And that's both enthralling and comforting. Another way I really see my teenage self in Casey is the way she'll make herself upset, because the control of making yourself upset is a better, easier pill to swallow than accepting you're upset about things not under your control. And I think JLB sees his teenage self in Casey too. I don't know, but when I was still in high school, I had a tough time too. And I know it can be hard sometimes, and you can get stupid. It's also important to remember the fact that Casey is still literally a child, despite how often she seems to forget that fact. But the film is constantly reminding us of her innocence, at least in age and fundamental maturity. I'm still scared of the dark. I feel like the two scenes we really see this in is when she first gets that message from JLB, and when she rips up Poe. With JLB, she starts out needing to be comforted by the ASMR video. As an avid ASMR listener myself, I know that puts me back in a baby-like state, with the motherly comfort and affirmation that comes through relaxing voices and hand movements. And Casey too needs that. Which is why it's so shocking how it devolves into JLB's message, which also has a childlike tone to it. You are in trouble. Something a parent would say to their child, not a stranger reaching out on the internet. And when she destroys Poe, it leaves her at her most isolated, actually. Her one true friend, as well as her deepest attachment to her childhood and innocence. That's who she systematically destroys. I had him since I was five days old. Which is, in and of itself, a really immature move that she feels is mature at first. Taking control by losing control. But it doesn't work. It leaves her sadder and smaller than anything thus far. And it's something she did to herself something no one else could do. I think on top of her relationship with JLB, Casey, like a lot of young and mentally ill people, spends a lot of time traumatizing herself without fully understanding what that means. But you can feel a turning point as she cradles the remnants of Poe, a moment where connection and isolation literally come hand in hand. A fair is a communal thing, an activity with people working, learning, and playing. It's also somewhere you normally don't go alone. You go with family or friends or a date. And the World's Fair specifically is one of technological innovation, the same innovation that led to Casey's inevitable isolation, but also led to these new communities, new legends and lore at a scale that wouldn't be possible non-digitally. And in a way, it's what the World's Fair was pushing for. It's in the name, World's Fair, innovation on a global scale to bring community towards globalization, an incredible and horrifying thing. At this World's Fair, we see lots of people too, only there through the screen. And these people are alone within their own frames, trapped in little boxes, boxes inside boxes on a recommended screen, most likely how you found your way to this video. The guy playing Tetris in his own body. Tetris, a computer game, one which we become addicted to so much we literally play it in our sleep, in our dreams. It becomes a part of us, like our devices become extensions of ourselves and thus part of ourselves. And so while kids who like creepypastas and internet horror may be isolated in real life, there's an active but dislocated community online. Still, the chicken and the egg situation when it comes to these types of kids being isolated is interesting. Are you isolated from your peers because you're into weird shit? Or do your peers and family isolate you and thus you feel connected to dark things? Because I love horror movies and I thought it might be cool to try actually living in one. But there's another facet of the World's Fair challenge that reflects so much of this young, emo, creepypasta-loving generation. Self-harm. Not only have other phony ritual self-harm challenges like the Blue Whale surfaced online, 
but self-harm in general is such a prevalent form of coping within these types of online communities. Speaking from experience. I'd see people post their scars and egg on others to do the same, proselytizing the release from cutting or bulimic and anorexic episodes. Still, I think a really interesting way World's Fair portrays this heightened sense of cyber theatrics is by showing us the difference between the digital dramatics and IRL mundanity, shown here perfectly with this cut between the dramatic video and how lackluster it is in her kitchen with the small light hitting her forehead, artificial like the plastic girl. And in the middle of the film, the film isolates you by taking Casey away, a low-key Hitchcockian move. And now you're her, or you're you, but either way, you're alone, made even more evident if you're watching on a laptop, where you can see your reflection as each new video buffers. And God, those buffers. That sinking, itching, dreading, but curious feeling you get when a buffer bar comes in. And the silence between videos, the waiting, the emptiness, a void. I can feel that sometimes in real life if I'm using a video just to block everything out and having everything rush back in when the empty black screen comes. Which is true of her and JLB's video making too. That moment where you're devoid of self after trying to perform the best version of yourself to a camera or through a microphone. And now it's just you sitting in a room with a screen. But knowing that's how you do it doesn't always help you internalize that everyone else does it that way too. Like how Casey's symptoms are seemingly less prevalent than others, trying her best to be as scary as she can with what she has, not realizing that other people around her had better opportunities to do the same in their way. It's hard to watch others idealize their own lives on social media without fully knowing what's real or not, especially if even what's under their facade still seems better than the life you're living now. Still, overall, I find really interesting dichotomies arising with all of these plays of gaslighting versus grooming versus playing, acting versus honesty, and my favorite of that is IRL isolation and digital connection. When we hear his videos, he speaks of collaboration, being scared together. His kind of creepy but fundamentally organic breath can be heard throughout all his videos. And where else but the internet would you have an adult man sharing his personal reconnection with a young girl, like JLB does at the end of the film? The more Casey and JLB connect, the more she's isolated from anything in her real life, especially her father. I can't tell my father about this, she'll think I'm fucking crazy. And it's interesting then that the only time they seemingly met face to face, they could barely speak to each other without it being awkward. Why is it that we can be more honest behind a screen? And does that make IRL human interaction more isolating? The middle class is so stuck in thoughts and interior comfort that we've got it all backward. But connection is connection, digital or otherwise. And being able to communicate pretty much globally, anywhere, anytime, to anyone, means the relationships we form online are now just as legitimate as those off. So despite the traumatizing relationship Casey and JLB had, especially on the night where everything kind of pops off, it's beautiful the way they connect remotely. Not even fundamentally digitally, just connected in another way but physical. He prays through the screen, his hand on this magic box, that to him, that's all Casey is. And to Casey, that's all he is. But it doesn't matter, it's still true. It saved her both IRL and digital connection at once. When I think of this episode, and Succession as a whole, I'm constantly reminded of the Edgar Allan Poe short, The Mask of the Red Death. Exorbitantly rich people, locked away in extravagant towers, only to be devoured by the same poison that caused them to lock up in the first place. Here's where we see isolation in the upper class. Luxury, safety, and security. But how is it safe? Calm it's down. It's just a room. And as the plot of Safe Room goes on, we're reminded that no matter how much power, money, or status one has, Every human body is equally vulnerable to violence like a gunshot. This is one of my favorite themes the show continuously looks back on. From the first shot of Logan's piss, the show is always talking about the fragility of the human body, zeroing in on Kendall's addiction and Logan's aging. The Roys are isolated from the real world in every sense of the word metaphorically, physically, visually. While a shooting threat is persisting through the building they work in, 
They're secluded only to receive information from social media and their fake-ass news station. Roman spends this episode sticking out like a sore thumb in managerial training after not knowing what the price of milk was. The only way the lower class can get through to Logan is with a bag of piss in his face, which is why I find such a poignant moment in this episode when Rhea mentions what's outside their window. Quite a view. Mm. Lady Liberty. The Statue of Liberty is an artifact initially meant to bring hope and prosperity to working class immigrants, and now it's only truly viewable by the elite upper class. Made even more compelling now that we know more about Logan's past. Not just that he himself was an immigrant, but one that suffered such a traumatic fate while coming here. And this is where luxury puts the rich at a disadvantage. That lack of experience, of closeness, of life itself. I find this is really portrayed visually when it comes to the Roys and partying, like the times we see Tom and Greg partying, but they're really just watching the party from above, always out of reach. Yo, this is what you do, you like come to a club and then you come to like this other part where the club sort of is it? Yeah! That's it! And of course, Kendall's so extravagant is extravagant even the word party. Then he mopes around, wishing his family cared about him, searching for the one gift that mattered out of hundreds of gifts worth our mortgages and crying. It just astounds me that anyone would want so much wealth that you can't even participate in the luxury you acquire. But the facade still isolates you from your family, your coworkers, from the idea of even being human. But another way people, all people, are isolated is when they're trapped in something. In Succession, most characters are trapped in unhealthy relationships, one way or another. Kendall doing his father's bidding, Greg working Tom under Tom is trapped in his marriage, Shiv not being able to get into the business, Connor is trapped Roman Jerry is trapped between two men, in between a Tom fork in the road doing the and work, staying but in the always middle. being trapped in his emasculation, having to indulge not being harmful ideologies in order to He can't to buy sexuality or masculinity, as Kendall can't buy happiness or his father's affection without pity. He's trapped with Logan after killing the waiter, and, like Thomas, trapped under the weight of hiding, lying, and guilt from getting what he wants in the worst way possible. A way that feels worse than not getting it at all. Yeah, it ain't gonna be me. <laughs> The visual theme of clarity is explored in a number of ways as well. We can see the glasses clarity as self-awareness, honesty, truth, or the lack there of it. Glass walls or barriers you can see through. Tom is stuck in a room with no windows, no glass, he's not self-aware. While it's clear Ravenhead is a Nazi. And when Kendall, Logan, and Rhea discuss the Pierce acquisition, Kendall tries to keep up a corporate facade, while Logan and Rhea, the seasoned double speakers, have no space for anything but bluntness, honesty, and being clear. The other major point of clarity throughout this episode is Kendall's relationship to Logan. After his ketamine-induced wedding incident, he's stuck being Logan's little bitch baby, and Kendall knows his ass is on the chopping block the second he does something wrong. There's a rare show of genuine feeling between Kendall and Shiv near the end of the episode, and we can see even Shiv thinks it's a play at the start. But Kendall's whittling down, his small vying for control by stealing candy and vape fluid like a petulant child. It's all to hide a very real fear he knows is coming. If dad didn't need me right now, I don't exactly know what I would before. And so, in this episode, we watch Kendall grapple with the clarity of his outlook and how bad that outlook is. Every character in this show lusts for power, money, and dominance so much that they trap themselves, either knowing or unknowing the gravity of the situation, trapping themselves and others because they can, and they think that means they should. I find this conversation at the end with Shiv so sobering when she can't even accept his hug without asking the angle. And Kendall's honesty here, the realizations and the come down, the dim afterglow, it's greed. Greed traps, greed isolates, and power leaves you alone at the top, just as unsafe as the rest of us. And of course, this has all been leading up to the perfect visual metaphor to consolidate everything I've said instantly, the roof. Because of the incident with the waiter, it's implied Logan had these large plexiglass walls put up on the roof so Kendall can't jump off. 
We see Kendall go up to the roof a total of three times throughout the episode, his first and last trips opening and concluding it. Of course, Baby Girl is serving Super Rich Kid's realness, but I genuinely feel like this 1-2-3 transformative visual metaphor is at the heart of Kendall's characterization. When we first see him go up to the roof, traveling through construction to get to it, I feel two ways. One, he's at his most powerful, chill, a place where he can go to be himself and think, see the world from the view he deserves and get away from it all. Or two, a toddler stuck in a playpen, especially when contrasting his image with the way Jerry and Shiv are talking about him. I also think he sees the roof as the only place to not be his father's servant. My dad wants me to do it. Uh, I'll, I'll do it. Although these protective barriers have stopped him from fully having the choice to get his way if he saw fit. The second time we see Kendall on the roof, the walls feel like a protective barrier between him and the violent, unruly, middle and lower class, supposedly wreaking havoc on the building. But also, in this moment, he's isolated from his family, tucked away in the safest safe room. He's curious the way he looks down both at the world and at his own suicidality. He's like an experiment in a little glass box. Give someone everything they need and nothing they want. What happens? And when we see him go up last, the camera pans up the Waystar building, this immense fortress of deceit and lies. And now Kendall is framed at his smallest against the wall. And from the opposite angles as before, he's a prisoner. He's trapped in this building, this job, this family, his addictions, his depression. And the more power he gets, the more isolated he feels. Not only from the world, but from himself, as seen in his reflection being shown now on the glass where it wasn't as evident before. And now when he looks down over the ledge, he's not curious. He's just suicidal. It's interesting then to me that the supposed attack against the building itself was a suicide. A nod to how Kendall feels. What he wishes he could do. What he is doing by succumbing to the force of his father. Visually, all three works use wide shots to their advantage, both to frame their characters as small and vulnerable, or to show desolation and lack of humanity. We see Casey speak intimately about her life from far away visually, a signifier she is dissociative of herself, and in both The Lighthouse and World's Fair, our protagonists are mostly alone. Our Thomases pass by the two previous wikis, and Casey is seen interacting with the voice of her dad every once in a while, but that's it. Even still, isolation is never seen as a truly bad thing, and our protagonists will momentarily relish in it, or use it to their advantage. Initially, Casey welcomes her isolation, and sometimes finds power in it. Take the scene of her exploring outside, and hanging out in the cabin on her property. While she's lonely, she learns to find solace in being alone, and prefers insular comfort to external risk. It can be good to find time to yourself, and to keep things to yourself as Thomas does in the start. Not only does his boss not have the right to private details of his life, but some things we're allowed to keep to ourselves, and it's better that way. The other way I truly think Thomas uses his isolation to his advantage is to take out that rage he has to keep silent anywhere else. When we're alone and we can be whoever we are, we don't have to feel or express our emotions in acceptable ways and can let out whatever we need to let out. So to bring it back where I started, watching these three pieces of media during the throes of the pandemic really got me thinking about the class divide. And I bet I'm not the only one. How the lower class is isolated by working essential jobs in shitty conditions because they have to, while the middle class becomes existential, sitting alone, watching more chaos than experiencing and the upper class watching from above, snug in their luxury, enjoying medical care and comforts at the expense of everyone else, and how the upper class tried to use it to their advantage, soaking up profits and continuing exploitation at a higher, faster rate than before. But so many of the 99% finally saw through the veil during the pandemic too, learning and growing together and understanding the plight of capitalism in new, internalized ways. In its own way, isolation can help us understand and rise up, it can bring us together. 
thank you guys so much for watching this video. As I said at the start, I'm thinking that this might become a little bit of a series, so if you have any suggestions, especially around those other films and series that I mentioned at first, I'd be so interested to hear them. And I'm also just interested to hear what you guys think about this. How did the pandemic teach you about isolation? How did it teach you about class dynamics? But yeah, this one was a real labor of love. This has taken a pretty long time to put together, but I think it came out pretty nicely. And I really hope that you guys enjoyed it. Anyways, with all that being said, thank you so much for watching. I really hope you enjoyed this video. If you liked it, maybe you could hit that subscribe, that like, give me a little comment, put that bell on, you know how it is. And I'll see you next time.